Hey, Walter Sorrells back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, a belt grinder buyer's guide. Welcome to my Knife Maker Belt Grinder Buyer's Guide. Now, let me just say this right from the get-go. I'm not going to tell you what kind of belt grinder to buy. This isn't a Consumer Reports type evaluation where I'm going to show you a whole bunch of different belt grinders and say these are the features of this one. And No. My objective here is to give you a sense of the features that are found on grinders generally, the various types of grinders out there and give you the tools for evaluating and making a decision about buying one on your own. You know, I haven't tried every kind of grinder ever made and I for sure don't own them all. So I'm gonna use the grinder that I use day in and day out as kind of a reference to give you a sense of what's out there, but uh, it's just a reference point. It's an excellent grinder, but it's not the be all and end all. It's just a starting point for you to do your own evaluation. So today I'm going to focus on 2 by 72 inch grinders because that's what most knife makers use. Perfect world, every belt grinder is going to cost, you know, $2 and have infinite functionality. But we don't live in a perfect world, so in reality there's a general correlation between how much you spend and what you get. Let me start by talking about function. The prime use of belt grinders is to grind steel. A belt grinder needs to be robust enough to grind bevels and to grind the general outlines of knives, hopefully without going through millions of belts and hopefully in a reasonably short period of time. Secondarily, of course, they're used to grind handles, wood, pins, pretty much every other material in the shop. As I said, I'll be using my Bader B3 here as a reference, but every grinder is not built exactly the same. Quick terminology point. Manufacturers generally refer to these machines as sanders rather than grinders. Abrasives industry professionals use the term grinder for devices which use abrasive wheels rather than belts. Okay, whatever. Knife makers call this a belt grinder. You call it what you want. The first thing to note is that grinders are typically referred to by the size of the belts that they use. As I said before, the most common knife making grinders use 2x72 belts. Now the most common belt grinder question I always get is, can I use a 1x42 or a 4x40 or a 6x whatever? The short answer is yes, but there are a few serious knife makers who use large 3x79 inch grinders or even larger industrial grinders, but by far the vast majority use 2x72s. And almost no pros use anything smaller than a 2x72. The reason is that smaller belts wear out very quickly, smaller machines don't grind as efficiently or accurately, and really wide belts, 4 inch, 6 inch, whatever, they tend to not be set up in ways that work all that effectively for knife makers. So my first recommendation is this. If you abs abs absolutely can't afford a 2x72, then go with something like a 1x42. But recognize that if you're serious about knife making, you'll rapidly want to move on to something bigger and more powerful, and that smaller grinder is going to end up sitting in the corner collecting dust. All right, let's break down the components of the grinder to give you a sense of what you need. The first component of the grinder is the frame itself. The function of the frame, obviously, is just to hold all the pieces in alignment so the grinder actually functions. Fair enough, that's easy. But anytime you're working with high-speed rotating tools made for removing metal, you have to deal with something called chatter. That's the tendency of work pieces to vibrate against the cutting or grinding surfaces of the device. Chatter makes it harder to work accurately. The more massive and the more rigid the frame of your grinder, the better it will operate. Now some grinders like this Bader use a heavy casting for the frame. Some use large steel plates that are welded or bolted together. Some use what are basically small arms or attachments sprouting directly off of motors. All things being equal, the more mass in the frame, the longer it'll last and the better everything will stay in alignment. Moreover, more mass equals more accuracy and less chatter. On a machine like the Bader, I can really bomb into it and it stays solid as a rock. When you're evaluating the overall quality of a grinder, recognize that a good frame is a heavy frame. 
The next component of the grinder is the motor. The best grinders typically have motors in the one to one and a half to even two horse range. Occasionally even more than that. My Bader has a one and a half horse Leeson. I don't typically bog it down, but I've seen guys who really lean into their machines and so they like even bigger motors. Even more important than the horsepower is the overall quality of the motor. Grinders exist in a really nasty, gritty, wet environment. Show me a knife maker with a super clean grinder and I'll show you a guy who doesn't make many knives. You will never be sorry about buying the best motor you can afford. Super cheap Chinese motors will work fine for a while. High quality motors from name manufacturers like Leeson and Baldor will work better and last longer. Shielded bearings, gasketed capacitors, and so on are best. Anything that keeps all that grit from getting into the guts of the motor. The motor on this baiter has lasted 15 years of fairly heavy use with zero maintenance and still works as well as it did the day I bought it. I guarantee you a bargain basement motor wouldn't have made it this far. Typically grinders either run at one speed or use variable speed controls. My machine is a single speed type so I run it at full speed all the time. There's a smaller power wheel that you can put on very laboriously that will slow down the belt speed, but it's such a pain in the neck to put on, it's just not worth it. As you can see, I had to replace the switch one time. The switch cost me about 30 bucks. If it had been a variable speed that I'd had to replace, it would have cost a whole lot more money. So variable speeds add complexity and cost. But when you're first learning to grind, it's really, really nice to have variable speeds. Point is, if you have the budget, you'll probably be happy you got a variable speed control. For me, it's not mission critical. You might find it really handy. Let me jump in here to mention that today's video is sponsored by Combat Abrasives. They're a family-owned American manufacturer offering a wide selection of belts. Now, I've used many of their belts, including ceramic, aluminum oxide, and zirconium. The prices are good and their focus is specifically on the knife making community. Their basic aluminum oxide belts come in at a good price point and last a lot longer than some of the inexpensive belts that I've used in the past. Another thing that I've really been excited about is their ceramic belts for roughing in the 40, 60, and 120 grit range. Their performance is very competitive with the big manufacturers at about half the price. So check out their online shop by clicking the link in the description. All belt grinders have a power wheel which transmits power from the motor to the belt and at least one additional wheel which might be called an idler and sometimes a tracking wheel. Now anything running a belt needs to have some kind of tracking device. Without one, the belts will run out of true and fall off the machine. Basically you have a crowned wheel and you have to have some way of changing the axis angle a little bit and that'll move the belt back and forth across the working surface. Now different machines use quite different locations for the tracking and some even use the power wheel itself. If your tracking wheel gets loose or doesn't run true, you'll be hard pressed to run your grinder at all. All of these arrangements can work fine if they're well executed. There's not really a better or worse way of doing it. The main point I'd make about tracking parts is the more robustly built they are, the better they'll work and the longer they'll last. If you get a chance to evaluate a grinder in person, test the tracking and make sure that the tracking works correctly. Okay, let's turn to the business end of the machine. An important point in evaluating grinders is how versatile they are. Some designs, such as Grizzly's knife grinder and Burr King's two-wheel grinders, use a contact wheel as a power wheel. The advantage of this is simplicity, which in turn translates to less expense. The disadvantages are that you can't easily change contact wheels and you don't gain the increased mass that comes from a heavy frame. Other designs, like my Bader, have replaceable grinding attachments which slide through a yoke or collar. I don't want to get too deep in the weeds here because to a large degree these attachment schemes are what distinguish the various types of machines. So there are near infinite variations on these. Some like the Bader and KMG have arms that slide on and off. Others like the Burr King have somewhat more complex assemblies. I'm sure there are many other approaches that I haven't seen. Basically all of these detachable gizmos increase the complexity of the machine 
which in turn increase cost. The advantages though are numerous. First comes the side benefit of the increased mass resulting from a bigger frame. Second, machines with various attachments are only limited by the number of attachments you can slap on them. One more point to look at is grinding tables and tool rests. Basically a tool rest or work rest is small and a table is big, so the bigger the tool rest the more tabley it is and the smaller a table it is the more tool resty it is. If you're planning on using grinding jigs a bigger table is important. Otherwise a little tool resty type table like this will work fine. Almost any grinder can be modified to add a big table if you want, but if you know going into your purchase that you want to use a jig for grinding bevels, you might as well start off with something that will work perfectly for you right out of the box. So my general point here is, once you narrow down your choices, study the attachment choices and options very carefully. The options that are most important to you may not be important to me. If there's a specific type of grinding, hollow grinding for instance, that you intend to do, make sure the grinder offers the right size contact wheels. If you're not sure exactly what you're going to be doing, make sure that you have both some kind of flat grinding and some kind of hollow grinding capabilities on whatever machines you're looking at. So I may be throwing around some terms that are mysterious to you, so let's drill down on this issue a little bit. There are three basic ways of introducing belt to metal. The first and simplest is what's known as a contact wheel. The second is known as a platen, which is generally a flat surface. And the third is known as slack belt grinding, in which the belt is unsupported. Probably the most common use of the belt grinder is to grind flat bevels in a blade. For this, you need a flat platen. This baiter has a detachable arm with a platen. That's this flat surface here. If you grind on a contact wheel, you'll necessarily translate the radius of the wheel to the radius of the grind. What that means in practice is that grinding on a contact wheel results in a hollow ground bevel. Now, if your machine uses the power wheel as a grinding wheel, which is the case with most two-wheel models, then you can only grind on whatever radius that power wheel is. If the machine comes with an 8-inch contact wheel, you're stuck with an 8 inch grinding radius forever and ever. Third, there's slack belt grinding. In this case, the belt is unsupported, allowing you to grind a soft convex radius. When you're buying your machine, if it has detachable arms, make sure you budget for all the attachments you'll need. I recommend buying the largest diameter contact wheel available, a very small wheel in the 1 inch range, and an arm with a flat platen. I also recommend buying some sort of table or tool rest. Okay, let's summarize. Now look, we all have to live within our means and you know, nobody's budget's infinite. But my first point is this, buy as much machine as you can afford. At the time that I've made this video, the best machines cost, you know, two to four grand. And that's just for the base machine. It's a lot of money, but that money will buy you more durable and powerful motors, more rigidity, more mass, uh, more flexibility. So if it's a question of waiting a few months to save for a better machine, you will not be sorry you did it. So beyond that, my recommendation, if it's within your budget, is to go for machines with multiple attachments. You know, some machines offer interchangeability, but you have to go, you know, use a lot of tools and diddling around uh, where others have simple slide in, slide out kind of attachments. Anything that requires a lot of fussing, you're probably not going to use it at all, so you might as well not have it. My Bader uh, and many others, you know, have fairly similar, similar designs. Uh, on those you can change arms in about 30 seconds. So I would recommend studying the attachments, the options available, you know, tables, surface grinding attachments, uh, jigs, whatever, and the means by which they attach to the grinder. Variable speed, you know, I went through a period where I really wished I had it, but now I suspect I'd probably not use it much at all. So I'm confident enough on the machine that I don't really need to run it slow, but when you're learning to grind, it's really handy to be able to run it a little slower. Also, some materials tend to burn, uh, end grain wood, for instance, so it's handy there. So if you have the budget, by all means, go for it. Where to buy? Now, most of these machines can be purchased from knife-making supply places that you can find easily enough online. 
uh, but some of them can be bought directly from the manufacturer. The price is usually about the same. So to me, kind of six of one, half dozen of the other. So another point on price, by and large, these are very durable, long life machines. It's not uncommon for people to buy a machine like this, thinking they're gonna use it, and then you know, a couple years later, they realize it's been sitting in their shop gathering dust. That doesn't mean that it's, it's a bad machine. It may be as good as the day that they purchased it, and you may, may be able to get it for a good discount. All right, here's the good news. You know, there are lots of good grinders out there, good manufacturers, good designs. So do your research, camp out on the forum, study the features, get recommendations from people you trust. Google's your friend. Uh, the more that you know, the better off you are. Buy a good grinder and you'll have an incredibly durable and versatile machine that'll serve you well for years and years. Thanks for watching, guys. If you feel like you got something out of this video, don't forget to subscribe. Also, click on the link to Patreon for a great way to give back to the channel. Plus, check me out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Links in the description. If you want something sharp and pointy, maybe a gift for yourself or one of the cooler people in your life, check out my Tactics Armory website and pick up one of our tactical or outdoor knives. And finally, if you want to learn to make hamons or Japanese swords, check out waltersorrelsblades.com where you can find videos about how I make hamons as well as forging, mounting, polishing, and fittings for Japanese swords. Thanks and see you soon!